Okay, did everybody get a copy of the letter? It's in the mail. Okay, it's in the mail, but everybody should have gotten a PDF. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's, it's the same text as this. Um, there's, there's, there are two other texts that are uh, floating around. Um, one is the hardback over there. You want to hold that up? From Holy Transfiguration Monastery, which is also based on this trans translation. And then there's this text from the uh, Conciliar Press, or no, Conciliar Press, from Paulus Press, um, which is a bit more academic um, and has a more academic introduction and notes. Um, what I wanted to do tonight is an is a introduction setting the scene for, uh, uh, for the text. And um, maybe next week, but maybe not until the week after, uh, actually get into the text itself. Um, but I want to talk about uh, monasticism, uh, uh, it, first the history, and then the structure and the idea of monasticism um, as a background to to reading this, because this is this is an essentially monastic text, um, and it's hard to it's hard to pull it out of that context. Um, uh, but it's something that has been read throughout the Christian world for the past thirteen hundred years, fourteen hundred years, <clears throat> um, both by lay people as well as by monastics. Um, and it, it turns out that the first book that was published in the Americas um, was. The Ladder of Divine Ascent in Mexico City around 1530, um, probably in Latin translation. Um, I don't know how many languages this, is, languages this has been translated into over the course of the centuries, but it's, but it's an extremely important text um, for the life of the church. And um, in practice, uh, many monasteries read the latter uh, either in church or in trapeza uh, during Lent and try and get through the whole ladder during the course of Lent. So um, it's not liturgically read per se, but it's, um, but it's up there. <laughs> um, so this might be a little hard to read if you're at a distance, but um, of course, what I'm going to talk about first about the history of monasticism. Um, of course, 33 AD of, uh, marks the crucifixion of, and resurrection of our Lord. But immediately thereafter started the persecution by the Jews. Um, and so uh, you have this whole, you know, the book of Acts is, is really very much the, uh, uh, the, the history of the persecution by the Jews. The Romans didn't get involved really in person, persecuting the church until Nero. When um, Jews blamed the Jews in Rome blamed the Christians um, for setting the city on fire, there was a, a an immense uh, conflagration that, that uh, consumed most of Rome, and it was blamed on the Christians. Um, and so that's when the persecution by the Romans started. And but and so seventy is a, is an important date because that also. Uh, marks the destruction of Jerusalem. It marks the exile of the Jews into into the uh, diaspora. Um, that's the real diaspora. We, there is no other real diaspora um, that you can talk about. This whole thing of Russians or other ethnic groups being in diaspora is a, not quite a right usage of that term. Um, but what it also did is it ended a, uh, a, whole, a whole segment of the church's early history. Um, because in that, in that first century, in fact, in the first 40, 50 years of the life of the church, um, as we read in the book of Acts, the disciples lived in community where they shared everything, they kept everything in common, they turned in their money, they turned over their houses, they turned over their incomes, and they all lived in common. They would go from house to house um, and uh, lived as a, as a community. Uh, there were two elements in that, early, uh, in that early history of the church, um, going all the way to the Edict of Milan, which was 
Um, both the persecution by the Jews in the early decades and then the persecution by the Romans. Um, and that was that that uh, added to the intensity of living in community. Uh, you had the, the kind of intensity of being constantly um, uh, watchful and constantly expecting martyrdom. Um, and so uh, it, it brings a whole new understanding, especially to us who have been, been schooled in, a, uh, in, the, in the teachings of the gospel, in a context where we don't even think about martyrdom, really, when it comes down to it. Um, uh, when the Lord says, if you love father or mother more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love wife or children or sons, wife or children or lands, or you're not worthy of me. That was originally the context, that in the context of martyrdom. Um, and so people had to be willing to be uh, constantly, um, uh, if to, to be a Christian, one had to be constantly willing to give up everything for the confession of Jesus Christ, to give, to give up everything in your life, um, your family, your possessions, everything, and even, and even your very life. Um, and so even though, even though the persecutions were not these vast systematic things, it, were, it wasn't like the persecution in the Soviet Union, which, which was uh, aided by the technology of, of the time. Um, it, was, it was sporadic. It was in various places at various times, depending on the emperor and and the local authorities, and in some places, Christians were more tolerated than others. And even back into the first, into the second century, beginning of the second century, you have church buildings and um, re and recognizable public buildings that, uh, that were Christian buildings. And, but um, but those also became, uh, unfortunately, tools uh, for the persecution. So, for example. Um, at, during the last persecution, I believe in 306, um, the, uh, all the Christians of Nicomedia were herded into the church, and the church was, the doors were, were locked and barred, and the, and the building was burned. And so um, 20,000 people died. It has to be a huge building to accommodate 20,000 people. Um, they had buildings like that in the Roman Empire. We don't often think that they did, but they did. Um, but those kinds of incidents were, uh, were not, not frequent, and very often the martyrs actually provoked martyrdom. They provoked the authorities. Um, if you go in and you uh, uh, pull down all the idols in a temple and you, you know, kill the priest and burn the temple, and it kind of provokes the authorities, you know. So um, <clears throat> uh, that was that also happened during during that time. Um, so there was this kind of dual tension: the, the tension of living in community, of giving up everything for the sake of the community, and of being willing to give up your entire life for the sake of the confession of Christ. Um, now. There were some Old Testament antecedents also of uh, Christian community life. And one of those was the community at, at Qumran, uh, which was a community of the Essenes. Um, probably the largest, uh, we have a lot of texts from the, uh, from the Qumran community, it's known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, including their rule of life and all of that. And for all intents and purposes, it functioned as a monastic community. Um, it, was, it was a male community of celibates. Uh, there were families and there were women around, but, uh, but the core of the community was, uh, was men. Yeah, you had to go through a fairly rigorous um, novitiate and uh, uh, you had to be screened before you could take the vows to actually become a member of the community. Um, and this community started in, at, at the end of the third or the beginning of the second century BC. 
So it long preceded Jesus in the gospel. Um, and so this was part very much, it was, it was present within Judaism. It wasn't, um, it's really important not to think of Judaism as some kind of great monolithic uh, religious entity. It was not. Um, there was no such thing as Orthodox Judaism um, at the time of Christ. Um, there were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees, and uh, there were the Essenes. And th then there was a fourth sect called the Zealots. Um, they all had different doctrine. Um, the, there's, in researching, uh, found out some, uh, something very interesting. Whereas the Christian scholars who dealt with uh, uh, all the, the Jewish sects were much more interested in the differences in doctrine between them. You know, how they always emphasize that, the, uh, and even the New Testament, um, that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and they believed in, you know, they believed in the judgment and spirits and, and angels and things. Whereas the Sadducees didn't believe in any of that stuff. There was God, and, that, and, and, and we were here, and when you're dead, you're dead. There's no afterlife, there's no judgment, there's no nothing. And it's just about life here. Well, the Essenes were something different yet, um, and they had, uh, <coughs> they had their own set of, uh, uh, of doctrines, um, and uh, of course, and it, it very much represents the tradition of the first temple. Um, so the book of Enoch and, and other similar <laughs> writings um, on that, in that tradition were very much present. Um, in Qumran, in the library there, and you know, and other and other Essene writings, and they rejected the Second Temple and all of that. But the main thing in uh, in the minds of the Jewish sects at the time was not the um, uh, was not the doctrine; it was there in how they applied the law um, and how strict they were, um, and so. Uh, the Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees had a certain um, idea, different ideas of how to strictly live according to the law. Um, whether you had to, whether you had to, you know, do all these washings and all of these things, or whether you could you could omit some of them, and you know um, what you could do on the Sabbath and what you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Um, uh, you couldn't open a jar if you had to screw off the top, but you could move the top off of a jar. I, it, it, the Jewish law got into, into all of this. Well, it turns out the Essenes were super strict in their, and they believed that um, actually you couldn't, uh, uh, you couldn't go to the bathroom in the city of Jerusalem because the whole city was sacred. Um, and and so and there's and this actually carries over because there's a lot of some of these old Judaizing ideas left in Orthodoxy um, that uh, there are some people who are, who freak out at the idea of having a bathroom in the temple. So you have to go across the <laughs> seriously. Um, they also had a law. Uh, the Essenes regarded all of Jerusalem as a sacred, as the sacred temple, as sacred as the temple. So um, you couldn't, uh, people were prohibited from having, uh, Essenes were prohibited from having sex in Jerusalem. Now, of course, the other groups, I, this is just where they lived. I mean, that was like, so, um, so this was one of the reasons why the Essenes regarded uh, the Second Temple and also uh, Jerusalem as unclean, as ritually impure, and, there, and therefore they wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, uh, this author, um, he talked, that, uh, when talking about these Jewish sects, he said that you had to be sexually explicit. <laughs> sexually explicit. Of course, he was teaching undergraduates, but so anyway. Um, but 
the, there was so you had you had this whole monastic community um, living on the edge of the desert, on the edge of the of the of the, of the Dead Sea, um, and they had up on the hills they had farms and you know it was a it was a monastery you know um, of course it was a, a almost a kilometer to the latrine that you had to walk <laughs> if you can imagine anyway. Um, but the one thing that was radically different between the Essene, Christ, uh, the Essene community and the Christian community was that the Essene community was absolutely exclusive. You had to be a member and you had to be a tested member and, uh, and your purity had to be attested to and, and you had to be a, a rigorous member of of the sect um, in order to be part of the community. Yeah. So you're talking purity, is that kind of... Uh, R J Jewish ritual purity. So bloodlines, not... Well, you're not coming no. You're not out and coming in? No, no, no. Okay. Ritual purity is, um, is about whether you've been uh, defiled by any kinds of... Um, all the things that defile you. Go, so, for example, um, you know, very often we interpret the uh, the parable of uh, of the Good Samaritan, where the priest and the Levite, when they see the guy lying on the side of the road, they cross by on the other side. It's not because they didn't have compassion. It's because if the guy was dead, it would make them ritually impure. Um, if there was some uh, if you had sexual relations, you were ritually impure. If you, if you, God forbid, ate with a Gentile, you were ritually impure. And there's this whole set, and they're not, and it, and this whole category of ritual impurity, um, and there's still an undercurrent of it in certain Orthodox Pietism, um, and especially women uh, coming to church on their periods. There's there's a huge there's a huge undercurrent of that, um, uh, because it's in the Old Testament. Um, it's um, uh, it's not about sin. It's not a sin to touch a dead body. It's not a sin, you know, to have you know, monthly period. It's not a sin to have lunch with a Gentile. Is that your own thing? Is that you're ritually unclean. You can't therefore enter the temple and, and participate in, in according to the law of Moses. Right, exactly. I remember that's, that was the important thing. Like if you touch a dead body, you had, you had to go through a certain process to make yourself clean before you could enter the camp. Yep. It was like being allowed for position. Right. And so, for example, um, uh, remember in the book of Revelations where it says there were um, uh, 144,000. Um, in the in the in the host of the Lord, who were all virgins. Well, that that can also mean that they were ritually pure, um, having abstained from uh, from sexual relations. It, it, you know, we don't as Christians we don't under we don't think about all of the. The, the the laws of purity and impurity and all of the those Jewish laws, but but that's actually a major context in um, it's an important context in the New Testament, but we just don't think about it anyway. The difference between the monastic community at Qumran and or uh, or the Essene communities and the community the communities of the Christians is not just about purity and impurity, although uh, uh, Peter, remember Peter and, and his dream how um, all foods were declared um, pure, all foods were declared ritually pure, um, and also as it was interpreted, that means all people are declared ritually pure so that you can, you can eat with anyone. Um, 
that would have that would have driven the the Essenes and all the Jews at that time absolutely wild. Um, not only was the Christian community open and not and not observing the law of Moses, but it was evangelical. It went out and tried to bring people in. Whereas whereas the Essene community basically all of its rules and laws were basically kept there to keep people out. Um, so that's like a radical difference. There's uh, some of the scholarship goes back and forth as to whether the Essene the Essene community at Qumran was actually Christian or not. So anyway, but enough enough of that. Uh, the Essenes, you know, they bit the dust in 70 AD. Um, and most of them probably became Christians anyway. I'm sure to their great relief as they didn't have to follow the law of Moses anymore. So, <clears throat> um, but then they got into the middle of the persecutions and the persecutions were nasty. Um, and if you read the Synaxarian, which is a, a wonderful thing, and you read all about the persecutions of the Christians, which went you know, beyond that time, um, it was really nasty. Um, you know how people were how people were tortured and murdered, um, and just like in the Soviet Union, you never knew when there would be a knock on the door and you would be hauled off, never to be seen again. Um, in Russia, it's interesting. You know, there was the, out of, coming out of the 19th century, there was this old Russian piety that you only went to communion once or twice a year. And that's after having rigorously fasted and gone to confession, um, which you would do during one of the fasting periods. And, and then you'd satisfied your obligation for the year, and then you ignored it the rest of the time. Um, but um, during the period of persecution, because, and that, and during, you know, during that early, that period before the Russian Revolution, a lot of people took the church for granted, right? Because I, Christian Empire, you know, the Tsar, everything was peaceful and so forth. No, after the revolution, um, people would, would started going to communion at every liturgy because you never knew if you would ever get to another one. So, um, it was a very, it was a very different state of mind um, that, uh, that people had at that time, but it was it was um, it was where the faith was absolutely the governing criterion of life. It was where the faith meant everything in your life, and everything else in life was subordinate to it. Um, and uh, this kind of intensity, of course, that wasn't necessarily for everybody, but the early church. Uh, very often was a, were primary communities. In other words, people where everybody knew everybody else. And it's interesting, in the liturgy of St. James, still, um, uh, there's a command from the deacon, look around and see if there's anybody who shouldn't be here. <laughs> because the catechumens were thrown out, of course, no... Um, uh, you couldn't even enter into the into the nave of the temple if you weren't even a, if you weren't a catechumen, um, and then the catechumens were thrown out before the great entrance. Um, actually, they weren't, weren't thrown out; they were sent to catechism catechism class, um, but they weren't permitted to to be there for the mystery of the Eucharist. Um, uh, this is something that. Uh, that changed radically. And <clears throat> the Edict of Milan from Constantine um, made Christianity legal within the Roman Empire. At that time, Christianity was about 5% of the Roman Empire. 5%. It wasn't until 381, under Emperor Theodosius, that uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Um, but during this period of the legalization of Christianity, um, you had the first Nicene Council, 
But you also had the development of early institutional monasticism. Um, now, starting, bef uh, starting at the end of the third century in Egypt, um, you had uh, solitary ascetics going off and living uh, in the desert. Um, uh, actually, the, uh, the area around uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai was one of those places where um, people lived in the desert. I believe the cave, Elijah had a cave there, right? Um, and that was where Moses went up onto the mountain to receive uh, the Ten Commandments, and it was the place of the burning bush. Um, so it was a holy place. It also had a source of water. And so ascetics lived in individual caves in that area. Um, long before the first organized monasteries. Um, in the earliest years of the church, and, uh, and St. Paul mentions this in the New Testament, there were two types of organized uh, uh, communities um, that, uh, that were entirely dedicated to the, to the church. One was widows and the other was virgins. Widows, obviously, women who, and especially if you read what St. Paul wrote, uh, women who were left with no means of support, who had no families, um, uh, and uh, so, the, so they were uh, taken care of by the church. <coughs> but virgins also were young women who decided they wanted to consecrate their virginity uh, to Christ. Um, and so it was a, uh, these were the first uh, types of monastic communities. Um, uh, and it took the guys a bit longer to get organized. Um, but they, it was all organized for the women very early on. Um, St. Anthony, uh, uh, whose name I think we all know, uh, started around 275 or 280 when, as a young man, he heard the gospel, go sell all you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Uh, being read in church, and he went out and he did it. His parents had died, he put his sister in a convent, he sold all the possessions, divided the, the proceeds, and went off, and he went and lived um, with a hermit whose name is lost now to history. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and so eventually St. Anthony uh, went to uh, a cave overlooking the, the Dead Sea, or no, the Red Sea. <clears throat> if, you, if you know the, uh, um, if you could get me a cup of coffee, I would be mm -hmm. most appreciative. Um, you have the Red Sea going, going north-south, and then uh, there's a line of mountains, and St. Uh, Anthony's cave was in those mountains looking uh, eastward. And then uh, over the mountains was the Nile Valley, or is the Nile Valley. Um, Egypt was a very, very fertile place, uh, not only for Christianity, but for many different types of religious sects and experimentation. Um, and, oh, thank you. Also at this time, in the third century, uh, you had uh, Saint Clement, well, actually at the beginning of the third century, you had St. Clement of Alexandria and the Alexandrian Catechetical School. And um, I think it was around 215, 220 sometime, that um, uh, St. Clement died and the leadership of, the, of that school passed to his, his great student, Origen. Um, and Origen was uh, a, an extremely uh, significant, per perhaps one of the most significant of the early fathers of the church. Um, I, I call him a father of the church because at his, his writings are the source book for much of the language of later theology. But he was also the father of all the heresies because his language is also the source of all of the major heresies that afflicted the church. 
um, Arianism, Monophysitism, uh, Polinarianism, uh, Nestorianism, all of that. So, uh, and part of the thing is, very early on, there was no such, there was no defined orthodoxy. Um, now, the New Testament was not canonized until Three ninety seven. So, um, there's no way you can say that the church is based on the Bible. <laughs> you know, it wasn't for four hundred years. It didn't come for four hundred years. You know, before before it was a cohesive whole. Um, now, the writings. Uh, the writings of the apostles circulated ever since they were written. Um, but in these early years, especially before the Nicene Council, vast, you know, there were all sorts of writings that were circulating. Um, and some of them were more orthodox than others. Some of them were what uh, the um, one professor at seminary called Christian bedside trash literature. The kind of stuff that you want to read you know, it's kind of nice, nice little stories as you're going to sleep, and you know, which is probably better than all those bloody martyrdoms and things like that, which also were circulating. You know, um, uh, and so you have, you had all of that. It's like how the Book of Mormon got started. Um, it was, it was a, a, a novel by a, a Presbyterian minister uh, uh, of an imag of an imaginative idea of Jesus visiting the Native Americans. Um, and only later did they come up with the idea that God was a space alien. Um, but that's, but, it, but, uh, but some of this early literature was exactly on that level. Um, and that, and some of that came out of um, the groups called the Gnostics. Now, Gnosticism um, was probably one of the, I'll use black. It was certainly one of the most interesting of the heresies that afflicted the life of the church. Um, there are actually, in, if you look at Corinthians, uh, if you analyze the text, it's actually an anti-Gnostic text. Um, and some of the other texts in the New Testament. So as early as you know the 50s um, of the first century, uh, you had Gnosticism being addressed by um, by the apostles. Um, you had Docetism before that, but that really didn't affect the church very much. Um, uh, the thing about Gnosticism is that it, had, it was radically dualistic. You had nice, neat columns um, of, of good and evil and white and black and male and female <laughs> and, and uh, spirit and matter and all of these other things. And in Gnosticism, um, you had all of these associations so that everything that was in the, in the good column was good and everything that was in the bad column was bad. So, um, good meant spiritual, white, male. This is, this is not about racism. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and all of these, and all of, and, and all of the, and, and spiritual, and spirit over matter, and all of these other things. Whereas on the on the on the evil column was black and female and material and all of these other. And um, and the the problem is that some of that created a whole kind of spirituality. And part of that spirituality um, was that uh, uh, either um, you lived in radical purity as an ascetic, so um, obviously as a male, um, uh, 
you wouldn't touch women, you, you wouldn't go near women, you wouldn't have, have anything to do with um, any, anything material, you fasted until you were a toothpick and, you know, and basically killed yourself in asceticism because the body was evil and sexuality was evil and childbirth was evil and the material world was evil. And so the idea was that you had to liberate your soul from the prison of the body for the soul to escape uh, into heaven. But, and the gnosis, the, no, the knowledge, gnosis means knowledge, was the names of the demons that you had to go through in the toll houses to get to the, cre get beyond the creator who was evil to called the demiurge uh, to in order to get to God. So it was this multi-tiered universe, and it was you know very odd. So on one hand, it produced a radical asceticism, but there were also Gnostic sects that said, well, since the body is essentially meaningless in this, and and the, and, and what we do in. In, in the flesh is essentially meaningless because what's important is the spirit. We can do anything we want. And so you had these Dionysian orgies and all of that stuff in the name of, you know, in the name of spirituality. Um, uh, that, didn't la that really didn't uh, get into the church very much. Master, those books that weren't Gnostic but weren't canonized either, like the shepherd that did achieve. Right. What do they fall into? It's just um, it's just other literature. It's worthwhile to read. It's worthwhile to read, and so like the um, so the the Gnostic the Gnostic text, and I br I bring this up because you know we talk about monasticism. It's all it's all about asceticism, right? And so it's the ascetic context of the culture, the ascetic understanding of the culture. Um, now, in in those early years, there were other books. Um, among all of those books that were being published as, or as it were, as copied and, and distributed as, as Christian books, there were the, um, un, I mean, the, the unchallenged writings of the apostles. You know, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, Acts, uh, the epistles of St. Paul, and the epistles of, of, of the apostles. Then there were these other books that were a little questionable. Um, uh, like Hebrews, which has no author ascribed to it, and Revelation, which is just weird, right? It's weird, um, and uh, and the, and the church wasn't quite sure, and they were controversial, but they were eventually included in the canon here. Then there were other books that were deemed as good and valuable, but not on the level of needing to be in the scriptures. So, for example, the uh, 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 Proto-Evangelion of James. That's, that's probably the most influential of documents that we have um, uh, from that uh, genre because all of our knowledge about Mary comes from that document. Um, and, uh, and all of the feasts and all about her parents and her, her upbringing and all of this, it's all, it's all in, in the uh, Proto-Evangelion of James. Um, why it wasn't canonized, I don't know. Uh, then there are other books, um, uh, like the Book of Enoch. And uh, the Book of Enoch was a very important book. Um, and, uh, it, and it remains in the canon of scriptures of the Ethiopian church. Um, so it's part of the Old Testament of the Ethiopian church. Um, uh, but the rest of the church did not accept it as such. Um, so there was, you know, there was, that, ref, that reflects the fluidity that there was even in the scriptures in, in the early in the early centuries. And then there were the books that were, were weird. Now, for example, there's some stories that float around, um, which you might have heard, how Jesus, when he was a little boy, was out uh, playing in the mud with the other little boys, and they were making clay birds. Only his flew away. And um, he got mad at one of his little buddies, <laughs> and the little guy dropped down dead. <laughs> um, 
and and do you know what book that's from? The Quran. <laughs> the Quran. Because the Quran also comes out of this. It's later down here. But it co comes out of the same milieu. Um, same thing with the boy with the withered, withered arm. Christ with his front arm because his friend bumped into him. Yeah, probably. And his father said, what have you done here? Right. Yeah. But some of the Gnostic literature is, is, um, is very strange. Now there's another, so there's another aspect of, the, of it though, which is also very interesting, um, and a possible source in that it very likely could come from the first temple. It's the wisdom of the first temple that had been passed down in communities like the Essenes. And um, in other words, all the teaching about the angels and the celestial hierarchies and all of these things, which later scholars ascribe to Neoplatonism, right? You've, you've all read about that, right? You've, okay, well, well, they accuse our tradition. The Western scholars accuse our tradition of being Neoplatonist like, they, like their tradition is um, Aristotelian. And the, they say, well, the Greek fathers took, took Neo, Neoplatonism and structured their theology with that, whereas our theology was, was restructured in the Middle Ages by Aristotelian. That's not right. The language, some of the language came in, out of Neoplatonism. But, for example, you want, you want the teaching about the angels and all of that stuff? Enoch. And those sources are very old. Very, very old. Some of Enoch material um, goes back to the first temple. Um, and so, uh, so a lot of these traditions that were coming together in the early in the early church were, you know, some of them were very old, coming out of out of uh, first temple Judaism. Um, very little came out of second temple Judaism, um, except resistance to it, because second temple Judaism was what was persecuting the church. Um, and uh, in other words, Sadducees and Pharisees. Um, but it, what it created was a context of uh, among the more zealous believers who wanted to preserve the intensity of the early church, wanted to preserve the intensity of, of being under persecution and readiness to, um, to, to die for the, uh, for the sake of Christ, plus that idea of asceticism, um, which was very present not only in the Gnostics, but also in the Stoics and some of the other Greek philosophy at that time. Um, so monasticism didn't evolve in a, in a, in a vacuum, in other words. It had, it had a, a very uh, important and strong context in, um, in the first, you know, the first 300 years of the life of the church. Um, when St. Anthony heard the gospel and withdrew to the wilderness, um, he began a movement. But that movement didn't get going until St. Anth Athanasius, um, who had been exiled uh, five times from his see, um, uh, one of one exile, you know, a couple exiles. He got went to the west, and um, but one of the exiles, he went to live with Saint Anthony in the wilderness, and uh, and when he came back from his exile, he wrote the life of Saint Anthony. So this was around three forty something. Um, that book took off like wildfire, and thousands of copies. Um, uh, were distributed throughout the Roman Empire, was translated into Latin, God only knows, un undoubtedly into Syriac, God only knows what other languages it, it got put into. But it was, a, it was like the A number one bestseller in the Roman Empire um, in the fourth century. And tens of thousands of people left the cities 
and moved to the desert. Um, there's a book by a guy named Dermus Chitty, uh, who's a British professor. Um, the name like Dermus, so it would. Um, he uh, wrote a book called *The Desert a City*, um, which is an allusion I th to, you know, some early writing. But literally, cities formed in the desert. Now, Saint Anthony <clears throat> was on on the east side of the mountains, in the Nile River Valley. Um, uh, at the same time as Saint Anthony was building <clears throat> or was living as a hermit you had St. Pacomius developing his monastic communities. And he had several communities. Um, only, whereas St. Anthony was a solitary, St. Pacomius developed community life, um, where people would live in little uh, houses, or houses with 10 or 20 uh, either men or women uh, with a spiritual elder who would, where they would pray together and work together and. Um, and there were villages of these houses. Um, and eventually, those um, monastic settlements grew to up to 10,000 people apiece. This is huge. You know, a, 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 a town of 10,000 people is a substantial town. Um, and they supported themselves through their agricultural work. And, um, and so there are stories, and you can read all about it in the Desert Fathers, the lives of the Desert Fathers, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. The lives are really interesting, and the sayings um, are replete with, with most profound wisdom um, that are, that's good for everybody, anyone. Um, now, St. Pacomius also wrote a rule for his monastery, and that was the first monastic rule. There, there was a rule of the community at Qumran. Um, and, but it was probably, I don't know if a copy was uh, circulating or, or, or what, but um, uh, St. Saint, Saint Pacomius wrote a rule for the community, which you can still get a hold of. Um, and uh, so you had this very intensive community life. There's uh, one pair of communities on either side of the Nile. Um, men on one side and women on the other, and in between them were crocodiles. <laughs> so you didn't have the boys sneaking over to the other side of the river, um, or the other way around. Um, now, at the same time as this was happening, you had St. Macarius. And you all probably heard of St. Macarius, right? one of the great, greatest of the uh, Egyptian desert fathers. And he organized communities of hermits. And both of these were um, in, the, uh, in the desert around oases um, uh, in, in areas called Nitria and Skeet, or Skeeti, um, which were um, in or just south of the, of the Nile Delta. Um, and the hermits would live in individual cells, huts or caves, or that they called them a cell, and would get together. They would um, they would get together and pray. They would uh, have some kind of there would be dates and palm, it was a, an oasis, so there would be palm trees and dates, and and they would be able to do some agriculture and and get palm leaves to go into the make baskets and take them into the city and sell them and buy whatever. Um, so uh, these various forms of monasticism developed fairly early. Uh, you had the Skeet form, which was St. Macarius' uh, uh, community of hermits. You had the hermits, St. Anthony, and you had uh, Kenobian. Um, I like to use the Greek word. Kenobium, but the original was Kenobian in Greek. <clears throat> 
And you, you all know the word kidania, right? Um, means communion. Um, uh, and so kinobian means uh, common life. Kino is common, and vios, life. Um, and so a cenobitic, it's the Latin, um, a cenobitic monastery is a common life monastery where everybody lives together, um, works together, eats together, prays together, everything in common. Whereas the hermits are um, uh, known as anchorites. And I'm not sure what the derivation of that is. Um, there is a, gr a, a word anchoresis. Um, but I think, what it, I think what it comes is, this is an alpha privative, and um, uh, choros essentially means kind of together. Um, so not together. In other words, they live by themselves. Um, so, this, all of this was going on between the first ecumenical council and the second ecumenical council. And from the, during this whole time, you had the scourge of Arianism. Right. There was another. There was another kind of interesting heresy that was floating around at that time. Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't come up until a little bit in, into the uh, into the fourth century, um, which was called anthropomorphism. And that was that. Uh, there, some some of the monks were very simple. Um, very simple, and so they thought God. Just like, just like in the icon, was an old man sitting in the sky. And so one of the, one of the intellectual, or one of the things that happened is that uh, you, had, you had these monks who were much more spiritually oriented and intellectually oriented, who came and said, no, no, God is not an old man sitting in the clouds. God is without form, and you can't even paint, you can't even make an image of him. You can't have a picture of him. Uh, God is beyond all images. He's beyond all conception. He's, and the anthropomorphites, who were basically just simple peasants, they said, you've taken away our God from us. Mm. <laughs> um, but what that does is it illustrates the kind of... Um, uh, uh, dynamic that was going on in early monasticism. Um, because on one hand, you had, for the most part, very simple peasants who couldn't read. On the other hand, you had these brilliantly educated aristocrats. Um, and all of the great fathers of the church were brilliantly educated aristocrats because they couldn't write like, they would never have learned to write like they did uh, if they weren't. Because their kind of, to master Greek like they did, takes years and years and years of schooling. Um, try and figure out a sentence of St. Maximus the Confessor in Greek. Lord have mercy. <laughs> um, The monks formed a um, uh, a bastion of orthodoxy, partly because of the teaching of the great the great theologian to whom they looked from the past, Origen. Now, Origen is the one who formulated. Of course, the church had always understood this, but he formulated. The, the words to talk about God as 
being utterly beyond conception, you know, utterly um, beyond any kind of ability, uh, are utterly beyond, uh, well, I don't know if we're quoting Origen when we say that God is ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible. We could be. Um, we're certainly alluding to Dionysius the Areopagite. Question is, does Dionysius the Areopagite come here or does he come here? <laughs> um, that's an interesting, it's an interesting problem. Um, but you had uh, uh, a whole spiritual theology that was developed by Origen um, that went like wildfire through the educated monks. And they all adopted it. Um, this became especially um, uh, important going into the, into the fifth century. Now, a little background on that. Um, as a young man, St. Basil the Great and his college buddy, uh, St. Gregory of Nazianzen, and Basil's little brother, um, St. Gregory of Nyssa, um, uh, went on a uh, road trip um, to, visit, <laughs> to visit the monasteries of Egypt. Um, and they came back, and they were in their 20s, and they were very inspired. Um, and so uh, they, adopted, they decided to adopt the monastic life. Um, St. Basil and St. Gregory, uh, on one of Basil's family properties, um, on the River Iris. I always thought that was a really neat name. Um, on the River Iris, which is somewhere near Cappadocia, um, it, uh, put up a little monastic settlement. Uh, Basil became the Archbishop of Caesarea. Um, uh, of course, all of the, the they went to school in Athens, they had the best education money could buy. You know, they, uh, they, they were lawyers, they had, you know, they were very, very highly educated aristocrats. Um, and so Basil became the Archbishop of Caesarea. Caesarea um, is, is the capital of Cappadocia, Cappadocia. Um, and that's that city, you've, um, you've all seen pictures of it, um, that's where uh, uh, all the dwellings and the churches are all dug out of, the, of, 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 of these kind of hills. You know, Star, Wars, Star Wars was actually filmed in that area. You know, and the idea of people living underground in these cave things, and, and um, well, that was <coughs> Caesarea and Cappadocia. But it was the major city in that part of Asia Minor. Um, St. Basil, following St. Athanasius, um, uh, or and they probably, I don't know if they ever met, but they, prob they might have, um, uh, they took up the banner of the First Council of Nicaea and the uh, theological, um, after a while, St. Basil did. It took a little while for him to get there. Um, and, the, uh, and fought for the, for the word homoousios in the creed, um, that, that Christ is of one essence, or of the same essence uh, with the Father. Because you had the Arians who uh, said that Christ was of a different essence with the Father, um, or, or uh, then the semi-Arians said he had a similar essence. And the difference between those is uh, between homoousios, same essence, and a similar essence, homoousios, is an iota. There's an iota of difference, which I think is where that saying comes from. Um, uh, hom or homoousios, as it's actually pronounced. St. Basil, now in a position of, of, of great authority within the church, um, did everything that he could to uh, establish a bulwark against the Arians. And so he had these old, his little brother and his college buddy, and so he established them as bishops um, 
in some towns as bulwarks of orthodoxy against the Aryans. Um, Nazianzen, where St. Gregory, who was uh, the, probably the most brilliant theologian the church has ever had, um, or at least up there with Maximus and Gregory Palamas. <laughs> Nazianzen was a crossroads. It maybe had a pub. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, not much else. Um, uh, and Nisa wasn't much bigger. Um, so it was a it was slightly bittersweet for both for both Gregories. Now Gregory of Nazianzen, like Basil, had adopted monastic life, but Basil's little brother Gregory, who was married, um, but it turns out that Basil's little brother Gregory of of Nisa uh, was one of the greatest mystics of the church, and wrote some of the most profound mystical treatises, like the Life of Moses which is an allegorical commentary on the life of Moses. So, <clears throat> Gregory of Nazianzen, uh, Basil died in the year 380. At the same time as Gregory of Nazianzen was um, uh, um, elected Archbishop of Constantinople. And so he was transferred from the crossroads of Nazianzen to the imperial city. Um, now the imperial city at the time was in the hands of the Arians, and the cathedrals and everything else were in the hands of the Arians, and the emperors liked the Arians. Um, and so when St. Gregory of Nazianzen gave his four theolo or five theological orations, or four theolo uh, they, they were done in the living room of a house, it turned into a chapel. Um, now, why, why is this important? St. Basil, having with his buddies gone, gone to the monasteries in Egypt, wrote the first rule of monasticism, um, or, or the first, uh, or the most, well, it's not the first rule, in, uh, but, uh, but, but the primary rule that is the root of all the other rules. You had St. Pacomius write a rule, but it wasn't widely, it wasn't widely distributed. St. Basil, because of who he was, and because he was the great champion of Nicene Orthodoxy, um, his rule got um, widely, widely published. Um, and it became the inspiration for uh, all of these people who had gone out into the wilderness to try and live the monastic life. Not everybody was called to the, to the Eremitic life, because that's really hard. It's really hard. Um, people, many people uh, felt called to a community life, and St. Basil's rule told them how to live it. Now, what's interesting about St. Basil's rule and the monasticism that it presupposes, so he wrote that around the year 360, give or take, which is probably about the same time that he wrote the liturgy that we use. Um, uh, it presupposes that the communities are urban. And it presupposes that the communities are engaged in social service. <coughs> um, hospitals, host hostels, hospices, um, uh, feeding the poor, taking care of, of pilgrims and strangers, and, and all of these other kinds of you know, very active ministries. Remember, there was, no, there was no state kind of welfare system or any, any kind of state um, social service. Um, and uh, so a lot of that actually goes back to St. Basil. Um, and, and the monastic communities that he organized. Um, and so this, it rather took off like wildfire. Um, so <clears throat> tales of these monasteries that were developing in the East got to the West. Um, and so people from the West um, uh, came and, and they 
and they, they read, well, they undoubtedly read the life of Anthony. Uh, some of them probably read the, the rule of St. Basil. Um, and some, such as John Cassian, went from Rome to uh, uh, Egypt and uh, saw what was going on there, uh, interviewed the monks, um, and wrote it, wrote it down. Uh, and you can read it today. It's called The Conferences of St. John Cassian. And in um, contemporary print, it's that thick. Can you imagine what it was as a manuscript? Mm. You know, it would be huge. Um, he also wrote another rule. And uh, St. John Cassian took these back with him, and he went to Lyon in Gaul, uh, where there was a huge Greek community. And uh, uh, monasticism was planted then in the valleys of what became France. Um, this is also the time of St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine was the Bishop of Hippo. Um, uh, St. Augustine did, uh, unlike most, most of these guys lived a very, um, shall we, had a fairly ascetic youth. They uh, may not have been baptized until they were adults, um, but when they uh, when, and when they were baptized, they changed their life and they adopted monasticism. Um, St. Augustine uh, lived a not so um, chaste life as a, as a youth, and he had a mistress, he had a son, um, and when his son died at 13 years old, um, it was when he finally, uh, thanks to the prayers of his mother Monica, um, uh, repented and adopted um, monastic life, and he formed, uh, he wrote a rule, and uh, for, uh, and his monks were called canons, uh, because it was basically um, a rule for uh, people living together as the clergy of a cathedral. Um, and so a lot of Western, throughout the West, and church in England especially, and as also throughout the West, you, you, when you have canons of the cathedral, that um, there's a connection back to the rule of St. Augustine. Um, St. Benedict um, was inspired uh, and lived as a hermit in this remote valley uh, in the Apennine Mountains, and he read uh, the rule of, uh, of St. Basil, and he read the conferences and the rule called the Institutes um, of St. John Cassian, and he, and he wrote his own rule, which then became the foundational document, kind of constitution, for most of Western monasticism for the next 600 years. And it still continues to be uh, the major rule of Western monasticism to this day. Um, now, one of the things that's also very interesting, we talked a lot about Egypt. We've talked a little bit about the West, but I, have, I haven't talked about um, Syria. Now, of course, uh, the gospel, uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic. The apostles all spoke Aramaic, and, and some of them spoke Greek. Uh, and the New Testament was originally written in Greek and in Aramaic. Um, and uh, some of it was uh, later translated then into Greek. So, for example, the Gospel of St. Matthew was probably originally written in Aramaic. Um, the book of Revelation was probably written in Aramaic. Um, I don't know about the book of Hebrews, but I don't think so. Um, Aramaic um, uh, was also the language of Babylon, and that's, I think, how it got introduced into Palestine um, after the Jews came back from Palestine. Um, and uh, Hebrew by that time was, was simply a liturgical language. It was a literary and liturgical language rather than a spoken language. Um, uh, the Roman Empire was politically divided into three major dioceses. Uh, we have a diocese, and you know, our dioceses are 
reasonably small. In the Roman in the Roman world, a diocese meant a whole region. So, for example, Rome was the was the capital of the diocese of the West. Antioch in Syria uh, was the capital of the diocese of the East. Um, and uh, Carthage or Carthage. Uh, Alexandria was the capital of the Diocese of Africa, um, which basically meant uh, most of uh, uh, Eastern Africa, um, and Carthage, I believe, was dependent on Rome. Um, but you, what there were was there, there were multiple languages, and, um, and the languages formed some of the thought forms and some of the attitudes and some of the cult and and of course the culture that went with the languages uh, basically uh, predicated the lifestyles that would happen in monasticism. So um, in the East they spoke uh, Semitic languages, right? Um, so at first it was Aramaic and then Syriac took over. Um, Syriac was spoken from uh, from Lebanon all the way to the uh, uh, until you got to the Persian Empire, where it was Farsi, um, out near the uh, beyond Iraq, um, and all of that area was Christian. Um, but not all. But not all of it was in the Roman Empire. Um, the Roman Empire kind of went back and forth depending on where they were with the Persians. And sometimes the Persians got all the way to the Mediterranean, and sometimes they got, they were kept back. Um, Aramaic being a Syriac language, uh, or being a Semitic language is very, um, uh, let me start again. Syriac being a Semitic language was very concrete. Um, and uh, its thought forms are very concrete. And the way of approaching things is very concrete and very material. So for example, the Antiochian school of, uh, of interpretation of the scriptures focused on the life of Jesus and his teachings. Um, and the focus was up, essentially up to the crucifixion and resurrection. But it was a very concrete focus on Jesus as a man and Jesus' life, you know, and his ministry. The Alexandrians, um, while, while in the main cities, and you have this for the, in the Syriac speaking areas too, in the main cities, Greek was, was used among the aristocracy um, and, and, in, and, and the highly educated people. Um, the, in Egypt, the base language was Coptic. Um, and remember, Alexandria was the home of all of these various kinds of religious groups and sects and cults and, you know, everything from the worship of Isis, you know, and the old Egyptian paganism. It was where Gnosticism got its start. It was, you know, it was... But its emphasis was, uh, was very spiritual and very eschatological. And so the Antiochian school tended, instead of uh, looking at the concrete um, man Jesus and, um, and his teaching, tended towards uh, an interpretation of the scriptures by allegory as an allegory of of the spiritual life and of, and, of, and of the soul. Now, obviously, they, um, you know, they focused on Jesus, but not Jesus so much in his, um, in his lifetime as he's depicted in the Gospels, but Jesus as he is now, um, enthroned with the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, in heaven. So it was this eschatological vision. Um, it's interesting, in, um, in Coptic churches, the primary icon um, that goes, that's behind the altar, and their altars are set up like ours, but the primary icon behind the altar is the vision of uh, Christ enthroned in Revelations chapter five. Um, so it's, uh, 
it's, it's, in other words, the deified Christ. There, it's no wonder that there was a conflict between Antioch with its vision of Jesus as the, as the teacher wandering around the hills of Judea and Alexandria with the vision of Jesus enthroned with the Father um, as the judge of the living and the dead. <laughs> um, in the West, you had uh, Latin. Now, in Rome, um, only the Aris in the in the first centuries, first, second, third century, the aristocracy spoke Latin. But most of the people and most of the Christians uh, who were slaves spoke Greek. And in fact, Latin was not a liturgical language in Rome until the fourth century. Liturgical uh, Latin liturgy, Latin theology, Latin uh, especially developed in Carthage, in North Africa. Um, because North Africa, the, uh, Carthage was the uh, breadbasket for Rome. Alexandria was the breadbasket for Constantinople. Um, so all the food to feed those massive cities uh, came from um, a rather long journey across the sea. Um, and, and can you imagine the kind of uh, shipping, you know, container ships that they must have had to have um, to, feed, to keep a city of a million plus people fed, or two cities of a million plus? It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty astounding. Um, so, I won't go into the conflict between Alexandria and Antioch, but from the year three, early in the, in the 320s, um, there began to be uh, barbarian ra raids um, against Rome. Unzo Leute, yeah? <laughs> Our people. Um, the North Europeans, the Germanic tribes, which includes the Franks, by the way. The French were a Germanic tribe. Um, so, um, and, uh, but the, the tribes, of course, that, uh, that took, uh, that eventually took Italy, and it took about 150 years worth of raids before Rome finally fell. But once it fell in 476, that it was, it, it was pretty much done, done with. Because, and the center had moved to Constantinople. Um, in the West, the monasteries began to thrive. And what happened socioculturally <coughs> with the fall of Rome was that the aristocracy moved to their country estates and fortified their country estates. And they took all of their retainers with them. So um, it wasn't just, you know, uh, the, the duke and his, and, and his wife, it was four or five hundred people that would move to these, you know, to these country estates, which became little towns and became castles and, and such, um, trying to hold out um, against barbarian raids. Um, the monasteries in the West uh, were, the, were the only places where literacy, basically, was preserved. Um, they did have schools for the, for the sons of the nobility, um, for those that they deemed needed to learn how to read. <laughs> um, but, and they did copy books and have libraries. Um, but for the most part, the Dark Ages were pretty dark. Um, uh, on the other hand, in the East, uh, Constantinople uh, was a thriving city of a million people. Um, in the city of Constantinople, there were, uh, 10 percent of the population were monastics. By the fall of Rome in 476, um, there were probably five or 600,000 people within the gates of Constantinople. Um, so that meant 50,000 monks. It's a lot, monks and nuns. Um, and, the, the, and that's just within the walls of the city. <laughs> 
Um, and then outside of the city, um, there were also monastic settlements all over the place. Um, monasticism uh, thrived um, uh, around Constantinople, um, and then eventually, um, and, and well, in Egypt, in the West, and, there, and then there's Jerusalem, which I haven't mentioned. Jerusalem um, <clears throat> uh, was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD. The Jews were uh, exiled all throughout the Roman Empire and forbidden to come back. Um, I think there was a law that no, no Jew could come within, what, something like 100 miles of Jerusalem. Um, and uh, it was rebuilt in the second century and turned into a pagan city called Aeolia Capitolina. Um, in, the, in the beginning of the fourth century, uh, Constantine sent his mother, Helen, um, to Jerusalem to scout out the holy places, and she found the cross, she found the grave of the, the tomb of the Lord, you know, all of these, all of these places, um, and being the mother of the emperor, um, she had all the pagan temples removed, not bulldozed, because that didn't work at that time. Um, but she had all the pagan temples removed and Christian temples built in their place. Um, and Jerusalem was transformed um, within a period of a few years into a, not only a Christian city, but a major pilgrimage center. Um, and because it was, the, it was the place where the Lord had lived and died and where the apostles had lived and, and so much of the history of the Old Testament, um, there were monastic settlements throughout the region. Um, and there were, uh, and it, it was a major center of scholarship. It was a major center of uh, uh, monastic life, both for men and for women. One of the, um, some of the most important women's monasteries of that time um, uh, were in Jerusalem. Um, everybody knows the name Melanie, right? <coughs> well, you've got two Melanies, Melanias, um, uh, who were, there's Mel Melania the Elder and Melania the Younger. Um, who were abbesses in Jerusalem um, and uh, whose monasteries were very significant. Um, there were some huge lavras. Uh, a lavra uh, is, a, is, a, is a kind of a monastery which, is a, which pulls together, which um, it's a huge monastery with uh, uh, satellites, basically, satellite monasteries. Um, and uh, um, so you have, uh, you still have St. Salvus, which is where our liturgical life was written, that we're still using, um, in right about this era, right in here. Um, uh, and it, so it's into this context that, um, uh, that we have uh, the development um, or rather the, uh, the advent of the Emperor Justinian. Um, and Justinian was, uh, uh, he, he reconquered part of the West to try and reintegrate it back into the, into the Roman Empire. Um, and, and Rome was essentially a vassal state of Constantinople for 400 years, and most of the popes were Greek. Um, as a matter of fact, like Gregory the Great. Um, and uh, he also built these, these fortifications around, uh, around the borders of the monastery, one of which was the Monastery of St. Catherine. Um, and the Monastery of St. Catherine on Sinai uh, was erected on the, on the side of the burning bush. It surrounds the burning bush. Um, and it... Uh, and it was the site of where all of these ascetics lived in this kind of um, un disorganized community across the course of, of several centuries. Um, this monastery uh, uh, also uh, became a center of monasticism for all the, all the, uh, the monasteries around it because it was it was an imperial foundation, which meant it had lots of money, <laughs> meant it had lots of resources, which it shared. Um, 
St. John Climacus, and next week we'll read his life, um, uh, became the abbot of St. Catherine's Monastery around the year 600. Um, he had already lived as a, as, an, as, a solid, as a monk in a community, as a disciple of an elder and a solitary ascetic. And uh, because of his uh, spiritual maturity, he was chosen by the brotherhood of the monastery to, um, to guide it. And so this book um, is a distillation that he wrote of, uh, of his understanding of the spiritual life um, and, and how it's to be lived. Um, now, some of it is specifically monastic. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about what the ethos and the, um, uh, you know, some of the reasons for monasticism are next week. Um, so, but, it, but this, is, this is the context, historical, religious, and others. So, are, do you have any questions? Comments? Could you follow me? Okay. Do you know who I was talking about? <laughs> Most of you do. I know. So, um, it's really worth. You know, it's really important to to know the context. Um. So. Um. And I would strongly encourage you to pick up the Desert Fathers, the writings of the Desert Fathers and sayings of the Desert Fathers. And there's lots of editions. You can probably even find PDFs for free. <laughs> so. Not a question, but just a comment. I don't think I realized before how much the Western monasticism happened around the time of the fall of the West. Mm -hmm. and um, that might be influenced. Yeah. Well, it was what pres monasticism is what preserved culture in the West. Um, and actually, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, you had Saint Patrick go into Ireland in the fourth century, um, and he established monasteries. Um, the method he used the by what the, at that time had become the traditional method of uh, doing mission in the Orthodox world is that you set a monastic community into, a, into an area to preach, to teach, and to just relate to the people and to draw them in and, and, and bring them to Christ. And then a group would go to the next community, teach and preach and bring them to Christ, establishing communities all over the place. Um, in Ireland, some of those communities were very interesting um, because some of them were mixed communities of men and women, and others of them were um, uh, had women as abbesses who had almost the authority of bishops, so which is a little, a little unusual. Um, uh, early British Christianity was was pretty much wiped out by the Anglo-Saxons, and then it was re-evangelized. Um, from Rome, starting with Augustine of Canterbury, around the year 600, right? When did the Anglo? From the top down by the Irish. And yeah, and well, the Irish went to the, went to the Scots, who were fellow Celts, and then you had all of these Germanic invaders. Um, and how, how much did they how, how much did they deal with the Anglo Saxons? Not time, I think maybe Montgomery a little Yeah, yeah, it's. It's a fascinating history. Um, just a little add. Um, I've been th looking at doing a, uh, a tour of sacred places in Britain, which would be a wonderful place, wonderful thing to do. Um, I think we might have a... Oh, I would totally go. <laughs> <laughs> a little uh, historical uh, uh, lecture to go along with our, with us and uh, to go to some of these places, but it, it's 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 really amazing. But anyway, um, so you had chaos in, in Britain for for a while, but the Irish were well established. And what's interesting is that the Irish connection, the Irish were connected to the Syrians because there were Syrian missionaries in Ireland. Um, and if you look at the Book of Kells. <laughs> 
that's actually Syrian style art. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a, a friend who did his uh, a dissertation on that. Um, so Ireland was Ireland was protected by the straits between Britain and Ireland from the Anglo-Saxons, um, but it was the Irish who re-evangelized Northern Europe, uh, who evangelized the Germanic tribes and the Slavs of Northern Europe, going all the way to Novgorod. And it's amazing in Novgorod, in Russia, uh, you find huge Celtic crosses, um, free, you know, these huge stone freestanding Celtic crosses. Only it's interesting, what they did is they built churches around them and incorporated them into the architecture of the church. That was really neat. Anyway. Um, but it was all, all Irish monks. Yeah, so St. Killian and St. Gall and, Saint, and so forth. Anyway. Does anyone have anything else? Let's pray.